From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague Noel is feeling under the weather, but he will be back soon. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. With the help of uh, the biggest celebrity on our show, Paul's dog, Ozu, uh, we are doing one of our favorite things in the entirety of stuff they don't want you to know, and it is sharing your stories with your fellow listeners. Uh, this is going to be a listener mail segment that I awkwardly described to Matt and Paul as, whoops, all voicemails. <laughs> so we've, <laughs> we've got some that we, we've got some that we want to, uh, spend particular attention on in our first half we're going to we're going to talk about uh, your mind and the ability to perhaps affect the passage of the clouds we're also going to talk about a situation that is hypothetical for many people but unfortunately was not hypothetical for a friend of ours and we are also toward the end we're just going to we're going to freestyle a little. We're going to play as many voicemails as we can, the ones that really stuck out to us and hopefully stick out to you. Uh, without further ado, Matt, what say you? Uh, why don't we set this this first message up by calling it a what would you do situation? That's right. This scenario is brought to you by Elron. Not that one. This one. Here we go. Hey, what's up, guys? Love your show. Listen to it for a long time. Um, my name is, we're going to go with Elron. I had something happen to me related to your shot spotter episode, at least a little bit. The other day, I go into a restaurant bar with some friends, and while we're in there, I go to use the restroom, walk in, go into a stall, sit down, and beside the stall, and the toilet paper holder is a loaded gun. It's kind of crazy to find something like this. It's a loaded 9 millimeter semi-automatic pistol. What do you do in that situation? And obviously, the quick answer is, oh, we take it, we unload it, and then we take it to somebody and turn it in and deal with that. Sure, sure, right, that's fine. But in my situation, I actually made some mistakes a long time ago, had addiction issues, which led to me committing a crime. Not a serious one, but serious enough that I'm not allowed to have a gun anymore. What do you do in that situation? Do you grab that gun and take it to a cop? What if the gun was used in a crime? And here you are, a criminal, quote unquote, because you are for life, giving a gun to a cop. And also that interaction with a cop, it's complicated. And what if, let's just say it's not me. What if it's uh, someone else? They might be terrified to approach a cop with a loaded gun just to give it to them. So I'm only saying this and I'm only calling him because I'd just like you guys to think this through, like, how would you handle this situation? And I thought it was an interesting scenario. For me, I did give it to a cop. It was kind of complex. I had to be very careful about how I approached the situation because obviously this same restaurant has kids. They could go in and find a loaded gun. And also this comes back to the whole concealed carry issue. How do you like, how do you leave a gun in a bathroom loaded? Obviously, the person was drunk, and obviously, that's super illegal, unless, again, the gun was from a crime. Anyway, guys, thank you for the time. Just thought this was kind of a good thought experiment, like how would you handle this situation? Maybe fun to talk about. Keep up the great work. Love your show. Hopefully, talk soon. Bye. Well, there we go. There's the scenario. Walk into a restroom within a restaurant and find a gun. What do you do? Ben, what is your initial reaction to that scenario? Don't touch it. Don't touch it? Fingerprint, but- fingerprints uh, would be key, et cetera, right? Do your best to touch it. That's obvious. Um, I, I suspect, first off, Elrond, you handled this uh, wonderfully at a great personal risk to yourself. 
because you you are right. And I, I think one of the most important things we can say is addiction is a real thing. If you are struggling with addiction, um, you, you know, it, it takes a, a great deal of personal strength to get to the other side. Uh, so there is, you know, you should be immensely proud. And we have immense respect for you for doing so. Um, this is not necessarily a hypothetical for me, Matt. So I'm more interested in your take before I TED talk or whatever. Oh, wow. It's not a hypothetical for you. Okay. All right. Wow. Um, okay. So I'll just tell you instinctually the way I first thought about this when I listened to this message from Elrond. Um, my thought was, and, and, and I don't know why, but it was to clear the gun. See if it if it has if it is in fact loaded, right? Check that, and then if it is loaded, take out the magazine, clear the chamber so that it's safe for anybody who might show up to, on the scene, right? And safe for me, depending on who shows up on the scene and what mind state they're in. Treat um, every firearm as though it is loaded at all times. But then I thought, not everybody knows how to clear a weapon. And what if you did it improperly, right? And like there's potential for that weapon to go off anytime you're handling it or touching it. And then I started thinking about the fingerprints issue. And if it really was com like used in the commission of a crime. But I, as I started going down that rabbit hole, Ben, this just became more and more and more and more complicated to me. And it, it really is like, do you, do you walk away from that weapon at all? Once you know there is a weapon at a scene that is in a public space, like what, like what is the radius that you allow yourself to get away from that weapon since you know it's there? And I don't think it's very, I don't think you go very far away from it, or I don't think you should if you're a responsible person. What, what do you think? Right. Is it, is it a situation where you say, well, I'm going to text someone who's with me and say, come here or call them, right? Someone sitting at the booth with you. Uh, if they're the kind of person that you can trust to keep an eye on that situation or go alert someone, is it a situation where you open up the restroom door and try to just yell for an employee, drawing even more attention to the, the you know, to the f that's going down? Uh, or is it... Um, is it something where, you know, in, in some situations here, especially in the West, the Southwest, uh, and the Southeast of the U.S. in particular, oftentimes people will take the firearm and just take, you know, especially if they're at a bar, it happens, you're not alone, Elrond, this happens yeah. to many people. This is not my situation, but it's happened to many people uh, where they'll just take the take the firearm and then take it to the bartender yeah. and say, will you put this in the lost and found? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Or Along just with the umbrellas. hold up and say, who left their gun in the sh <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Just so, yeah. And and this, um, so it does become, it does become complicated because you have to, th there are too many unknowns, mm -hmm. right? Too many variables. It could be something as simple as, as someone who said, I have to, you know, someone who said, I have to like, uh, I have to drop a hot mixtape, do a number two, and I want to put my firearm somewhere. And then they forgot and they left, right? People are very good at losing things. Human mm -hmm. beings lose stuff all the time. How many people lost their, like what, we, we've we been talking for maybe maybe a couple minutes, uh, not even 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, how many people in this country just left their passport somewhere? That, yes. One of the most important documents they own. You know, it's not necessarily criminal. I, I You're right. How many times have you lost just your wallet or your keys or something? Just misplaced them, especially if you're busy doing something else. And it's an object that you always have on you. You're just so used to it being on you. You're so used to be used to it being there. If you put it somewhere just, you know, for a moment to get something done, your brain may just forget that that thing occurred. And if you're it, it really depends on how familiar you are with firearms and how uh, often you carry. Like, let's say how often you open carry or concealed carry, because it may just become so commonplace the way I carry my gun 
I place it down when I use the restroom because it's a necessity for me to remove my gun to use the restroom uh, where where it is, right? You don't stay strapped? You don't keep it pointed at the stall door? <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> like no one's going to catch me pooping. Wiping with one hand. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I see what you're saying. You're... Yeah, I think we're of the same mind. People can you we absolutely normalize things like a lot of folks do the the check, right? Um you know, it's the thing that Catholic kids use to remember uh the move with the spectacles, testicles, watch, whatever. But, wallet and watch, uh, yeah. Yeah, wallet and watch. But the one of the things, at least when I've been in those situations, to remember if you find a rando firearm, um it does need to be moved. It does need to go somewhere. But, and this is just one paranoid entity's opinion, anytime you are interacting with that without a witness, without a second pair of eyes, then you are potentially opening yourself up to some very uncool things. Yes. So, like Elrond, you refer to you refer to this as complicated, and it is. Uh, and thank goodness uh, the law didn't try to jam you up or something. You know, what if like what if you touch the gun? What if you touch the farm? You pick it up without a glove, without any like you know. Probably the closest thing you would grab is paper towels, right? Mm-hmm. Something like that, some kind of paper product. Well, you pick it up. Your fingerprints are on it. And you realize it doesn't have a serial number. Mm, Whoops. Not a good look. Even no. if your intentions are good, you know, now it's now you are inherently in some way involved. You are going to lose time. At the very least, you're going to mm-hmm. lose time because um, because law enforcement is going to want to know every single detail about how you found a dirty gun. Well, right? yeah. Well, and and let's say you do that, you take that action, actually touch the weapon, even if you use a paper towel, even if you had latex gloves just on you for some reason and you picked the gun up, you could still be contaminating potential evidence on that firearm if it was used in a crime, right? So what I want to do really quickly is just give you three uh, places where you can learn more about this and where this was kind of answered pretty succinctly for me. And the first place is on a website called American Concealed, and it's an article titled, What Do You Do If You Find a Gun? In this article, it notes that several people have, had commented on their site that, yes, I have accidentally left my firearm in a bathroom stall in particular because of this thing that we're describing here. You remove the weapon from your holster to use the restroom, you forget that you did that, and you walk out. Um, they, you know, they recommend... A lot of things, and they're really speaking to an audience of people that is familiar with guns, right? So they're they're showing you or they're describing to you the best way to do this and then to get it to perhaps a police officer or to someone who can then report it to a police officer. I probably, for someone not familiar with guns, I would not recommend any, not anything they say on that site, but I would not recommend using that site as your source. This has some baseline now uh, prerequisites, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. To know how to handle a firearm safely, to know how to discharge, clear a gun, right? Um, yep. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, Matt, but I'm I'm not surprised that some of the spice is I- exactly what I what I would have said. I don't know. Mm, I I mean, it is so situationally dependent. I'm. I feel like if you take a photo of it, for instance, in in situ, in location, then you need to make sure that you're also immediately following on some other steps. But Elrond's situation, yeah. right, is different. This isn't this isn't a vacant apartment building, you know? It's not a it's not a squat house. It's not like a place I used to hang out in my graffiti days or something with crap on the wall and literal crap on the floor. This is a family restaurant. So what a pickle. If you leave, 
right? Mm-hmm. Even if you just take the time to walk to the host station or or the bar mm-hmm. or the kitchen line, if you don't have line of sight on that door, who's to say that a nine-year-old might not just wander in and say, oh, best Christmas ever, right? Like this is... Yeah, it's worst case this scenario right there. Stuff. Yeah, I, I'm doing worst case, but I interjected. What's wh- no, no, what's your take? Well, you're right. That's where my mind, where my mind goes to, Ben. Uh, another place you can look, there is a subreddit about dumpster diving titled slash r slash dumpster diving. And on here, there's a quick thread. You found a gun. What now? And on here, you also have some pretty good advice. Again, some of it is just like... Uh, supposing that you were going to actually touch the weapon and that's, this is where I'm going to put a kind of a stop to that. I I think no matter what, who you are, no matter how familiar you are with firearms, no matter what your criminal history is, if you've got one or any at all, I think this is the correct procedure because it comes directly from a very high ranking uh, law enforcement officer in a part of Georgia where, where I've lived. I spoke with this person through email and on the phone today. I'm going to give you exactly what I asked this person and exactly how they responded. Okay. I said, what is the correct procedure for a civilian if they find an unattended firearm in a public space? And I said, I think the obvious answer is to report the firearm to local law enforcement as quickly as possible, but how to go about it safely for both the officer and the civilian seems like it could get complicated. This person responded, the best course of action is to call 911 from where you from where you are so that moment you have eyes on the firearm dial 911 then and request an officer to be dispatched to collect the weapon you can specify that it's not a an emergency but there is a it appears to be a live weapon and you need it to be taken right i asked are you if you're familiar with firearms should you clear the weapon the answer was no I asked if you should refrain entirely from touching the weapon in case it was used in the commission of a crime. They said, if at all possible, do not touch the weapon. Stay nearby so no one else touches it as well. Again, that's like more an evidence collection for this thing, potential evidence collection. I asked if the weapon is found in a place easily accessible to children, should you move the weapon to a secure location? Again, The answer here is the best course of action is not to touch the weapon, remove the children from the area if possible and wait for law enforcement, which seems like, you know, so those are the official answers, right? Uh, They're, they're not official. I I wasn't allowed to give you guys like who this person was and what uh, organization they represent, or at least they're a part of, but that is some, a very high ranking person in a real law enforcement agency. Um, I don't know. I, I think that's probably what you should do. Or if you're not comfortable calling 911, if someone you know or someone is with you who's comfortable or maybe a bystander who is also there, maybe have them call 911 to report it. I mean, I don't, I don't know. know about that too because they're going to get grilled on how they found it. You know, that's, I guess that's, that's true. the thing. Like what if you do if you, for one reason or another, can't be, can't be speaking with 12, you know, or whatever street name you want to use for law enforcement. Uh, there is something else though that I, I think this is the last point I want to make here. If you, people are not stupid for the most part, given the opportunity to really think about what's going on, people are extraordinarily intelligent So if you find a gun just sitting on the top of a commode, sitting on the tank or something, then it's less likely that someone used it in a crime and said, you know, here's the perfect place to hide it, (laughs) TGI Fridays. They have such a terrible reputation because of the cheese stick controversy that they're never, no, no cops are even going to come here. Hey, uh, that but, was, hey, that was just a licensing thing. The frozen TGI Fridays, quote, mozzarella sticks that you can find at your local grocery store are not the ones that TGA, TGI Fridays makes in their restaurants. I f- just they found got that out. to you. I can't believe it. <laughs> of all the organizations, that's the one that compromised our show. <laughs> I knew it. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. Anyway, no, the uh, the. Uh, <laughs> well, T.S. Eliot there. Uh, but the following on that, the natural response is, and look, for we have people listening who have had to live on the streets before for mm-hmm. one reason or another, right? And there's no judgment there. But you know 
that if you find a firearm, a serviceable, usable firearm, in a place like a sewer or like a dumpster or some other place where the normal person, the normal sieve is not supposed to be looking, then that's probably hot. Not saying it has bodies on it, but it may have been, the odds are higher than zero that it was, that it was used in, in something, you know? Um, so please, please just, just be safe and know that there are a lot of people who accidentally find themselves embroiled in events, perhaps unfairly because they were not thinking through the implications. So I want to again, thank Elrond here for, uh, for being fully aware, for doing the right thing, for thinking through it. And uh, we, without having more details, you know, your mileage may vary, but as long as you can essentially establish a chain of command there, a, a chain of um, an evidentiary chain, right? A chain of um, ownership and custody, then you will hopefully be okay. Even if it's something as simple as telling the restaurant tour, uh, restaurant staff, you know, I found this firearm. Don't fire it in the middle of the lobby and say, who left this in the shirt? <laughs> I love that phrase. Um, you can, uh, you could tell them, look, I don't want to be involved. Here's the thing. I found it. But you, when you say that, you have to know that if pushed, the restaurant staff is going to give every detail they have about you as well. It's a real pickle, and it's a great question. You know, Matt, I'd love to hear other people's responses because I know that uh, we're not the only folks who have found themselves in a non-hypothetical version of this. Absolutely. Write to us, conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Also call 1-833-STD-WYTK. Thank you again, L. Ron. We'll be right back with more listener mail. And we have returned uh, thanks to a sponsorship from our pal, Kate Bush. No, I'm kidding. This is going to be something different. This is a lovely message we received from our pal Grady. And uh, Matt, you actually, uh, this one really spoke to me. You spoke with Grady directly. So let's, let's go ahead and play this lovely little message and then let's dive in. Hey guys, um, I've called a, a couple of times, but I wanted to discuss something interesting that I've been practicing and that I have also encouraged my friends to practice, and we have all had success in this, which to me, and I'll get into this, but it speaks to the true potential that humans have within them. And I don't know if you guys have discussed this topic before, but it, it's a, a, a practice called cloud busting. And... I practiced at this for a while, you know, couldn't find my process. And then once I did, I realized that I could bust, I could make any cloud of my choosing disappear. White, puffy, gigantic clouds disappear. So I call one of my best friends. I tell him about my success with this. And he has an open mind, but he's like, I got to try this for myself. Sure enough, I get a call that night saying me and my girlfriend went outside and the clouds were covering the moon. And I looked at her and told her we're going to bring the moon out. So my best, one of my best friends and his girlfriend held hands and keep in mind the clouds were covering the entire sky and they were able to dissipate the, this gigantic cloud and bring the moon out uh, in, in short i know I, i'm coming to my time limit here i would like you to do some maybe do some research into this and just share it with people because any person can do this by focusing their intention on a certain cloud 
finding their process, which can be different for certain people, but it just shows the incredible power that we have as human beings that we don't, that not everybody realizes is in each and every one of them. So that's all guys. I just thought it was a really cool thing that maybe, you know, bring up on one of your shows one of these days, but love what you guys do. Amazing stuff. Um, love you guys. Take good care of yourselves. Um, loving the book too. Okay. Take care. Boom. Thank you, Grady. What a tick in all the boxes on on a good voicemail. I don't have to you don't have to say you love this show that will not influence our choice mm-hmm. <laughs> on what what we're uh fortunate enough to air but um Grady Grady your message really struck a chord with me. I suspect with you as well, Matt, because uh we have done a lot of episodes on or we've done a significant amount of episodes uh both in the video and audio realm on the idea of cloud bursting or cloud busting and uh, Matt's initial reactions first. I've got to get it from you, man. The people want to hear it. Did you try this as a kid? Uh, yeah, but see, it was a vape term back then, like busting some clouds, you know? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no. <laughs> right no, on. I did try this. I, it was more, it was never about bursting the clouds or anything when I was a kid, it was just more watching the clouds change and evolve as, you know, into different shapes and animals and things, right. As they kind of change shape because clouds do change shape as they travel and grow and uh, dissipate. Uh, I remember learning about this for the first time when we were covering orgone energy mm-hmm. and Shout attempts, out to Willem Reich. Yeah. Mm-hmm, and attempts to, actually create physical structures that would house a particular type of energy that could then be aimed and used to do the same process. But I didn't know you could basically, I guess, meditate in a way or just focus intention to do the same thing. Yeah. The idea of, uh, so you're bringing up some excellent stuff here, man. So the idea of busting a cloud with the power of one's mind right it's a it it exists in a roughly similar school of thought to the belief in rainmakers the idea that if one concentrates with the right techniques one can generate storms right generate moisture and uh this is a huge part of um, North American folklore and discourse and existed way before Europeans were ever on the scene. You know what I mean? Uh, the, oh gosh, there's a couple things to unpack here. So Wilhelm Reich, you know him, you love him. Uh, BBC once called him the man who thought orgasms could save the world, mm-hmm. which you'll have to check out our episodes <laughs> to go. We're talking about, but it's about, it's all about that orgone energy, baby. Um, he saw he, he was a doctor and a psychoanalyst, right? Active all the way up to 1957 uh, when he died. And he believed that he had found a universal energy that could be focused, that could be channeled to create uh, any number of observable physical effects. And he had a lot of followers. One of the things, like, I read about this guy was different in a different life before I ever thought I would be doing podcast stuff on air. And the thing that got always stood out to me about this story and to you as well, I imagine is that upon his death, he was entangled with the FBI, been arrested by the FBI. A lot of his work was destroyed, right? He was profiled, um, because they accused him of being a communist, a subversive, all this stuff. He was once listed as a key figure on the enemy alien control unit. So whatever he was doing, for one reason or another, Uncle Sam did surveil him, and that lent a lot of accidental credibility to his theories, which remain controversial and widely rejected by academia today. However, there still is um, 
there's still an active group of, um, there's an active institution, the Reich Institute, I believe. Uh, so anyhow, he built this machine that you were talking about. And if you look at the machine, the first thing I think we should say is keep an open mind. <laughs> You know, keep it open I think with this mind. entire topic, the first thing you have to do is yes. keep an open mind. Just keep, just keep that, keep the barn doors of your <laughs> consciousness open. Uh, send the critical thinking out on a field trip for a little bit and just play what if. So, Matt, you've seen pictures of the Reich Cloud Buster. He designed a, 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 a thing that he said could produce rain by manipulating this orgone energy, which he felt was ambient already in the atmosphere and in every human being, similar to, almost similar to midichlorians, honestly, uh, for Star, Star Wars fans. Uh, but how would you describe this cloud buster? Uh, well, I, which one do you mean? I know the one that I've seen from the video series we made on this, it looks like a series of tubes almost that are pointed almost turret like or anti aircraft gun like to me. Yeah. Which would yeah, make yeah. sense. And it appears to uh, aim, that's what like focuses and aims the orgone energy. What I don't understand is are the bits that it's actually attached to. Because if I'm recalling correctly, it had something to do with crystals to actually store the energy is that wrong right metal fillings crystals and then a series of flexible metal hoses mm. right uh and the idea is you aim it at some point in the sky the anti-aircraft comparison is really apt uh you aim it at some point in the sky and it's weird that he calls it a cloud buster because his goal is to generate clouds to Ooh. become a rainmaker, right um, the idea of dispersing clouds with the power of one's mind for Reich, that would be a different, um, that would be a kind of different application of orgone energy um, to others. If you're just loosely defining this in the pantheon of uh, psychic powers, this would be a form of telekinesis, right? Atmospheric level telekinesis. And, if you do, you can try this at home. You will not be harmed, you know, use common sense. But if you are lucky enough to live in a place that has moderately good weather and uh, Dixie Chicks wide open space somewhere nearby, find a nice day, uh, a day when there are cumulus clouds. Cumulus clouds are the ones that look kind of flat on the bottom. And I got that big cotton candy puff, you know, they sail like brigantine, like ships across the sky. Go there and stare. Pick one, stare. You can, this is a great meditative exercise. You can picture what it looks like because humans are great pattern recognizers. Uh, you can concentrate on, in your mind, dispersing it. And if you concentrate long enough, the cloud will move and disperse. The question is correlation or causation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, there, are, the, like, uh, there's a great, there's an article by Jesse Farrell over at a place called AccuWeather.com, who raises the point of um, observation here. And the, the point of observation is is this. I, I guess the best way to do it. We talk about this with UAP, right? Most people. Most people cannot identify a specific craft in the air, right? You can see something and you can say, that's a plane. And if someone says, oh, cool, what generation and what type and who made it? You'll just say, mm, nah, nah, nah. you know, <laughs> it's, it's relatively rare. Um, and even experienced pilots, even experienced aerospace engineers might have a tough time seeing discerning a spe specific type of plane from the ground, a better example would be, have you ever seen, a, have you ever stood next to a traffic light when it's on the ground, when you're not looking at it from your car? Wait, so the, the red, yellow, and green ones? Staring yeah, at those? That, yeah. Just, yeah, they're bigger than you think if ah, you stand next to them because yes. you're used to seeing them further away, right? Mm -hmm. um, and higher up. I would also posit, and I've certainly done this, uh, 
many people, I suspect, spend time focusing on a red light and turning it green, you know, with the power of my mind. Uh, <laughs> you know how many times I've done that with like a soda can or something where I just stare <laughs> at it for I still way it. too long? <laughs> I still do it. I still, I, and I, I feel like this is a beautiful thing. I, I will walk into a place that has automatic doors and mm-hmm. I like to wave my hand like Magneto, you know yeah. what I mean? Or yeah. Jane Grey. And, uh, and this is not, it, look, this is not dismissive of this. I want to get the AccuWeather thing first and then let's, um, let's unpack a little bit more because there is more to the story, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so first, our pal Jesse Farrell over at AccuWeather explains the cloud busting phenomenon this way again we've established if you go out there and you look you observe a cloud long enough you will see it move you will see it disperse jesse farrell and other meteorologists say this is because the atmosphere up there is it simply looks more stable than it actually is from our vantage point the same way that a traffic light looks smaller than it is, right? The same way it's tough to tell the exact model of a plane. So the atmosphere up there is very windy, it's chaotic, and these puffy, beautiful cumulus clouds are temporary. You, When you're looking at a clear sky, what you're not seeing is the swirls of temperature, right? The battling differentials of humidity inter- interacting with each other. And Farrell describes these clouds like a leaf on a stream or they're bubbles in a stream because it, they're so fragile. So they don't last super long. The clouds that last the longest, the ones you really want to try to bust up if you're imp- deploying atmospheric telekinesis would be things like thunderstorms. They've just got, they got more stuff going on. You know what I mean? They're more interesting characters if you're writing for the sky. Yeah. Well, or if you're in the U.S., you know, the western side of the U.S., you want to make those. Like as many as you possibly can. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Or what if, okay, cirrus clouds. I, I I love studying clouds. So cirrus clouds are the wispy guys, you know, the little smeary looking guys. And they are much higher in the atmosphere. Because they, they have less content, really. You know, the more water you get, the lower you get, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so those are those are going to last longer. They might seem harder to bust with your mind. But with, with all this um, <laughs> in mind, uh, I have to ask, uh, Matt, does that explanation from, from meteorologists does that satisfy what you're thinking? Like, because essentially what they're saying is since the atmosphere is dynamic and it's always moving and, and all things are ephemeral, you're going to stare at a cloud until it goes away. And it might be easy to think that you created that. Yes. I wholeheartedly agree with that scientifically because the scientific process would take place of that dissipation um, if you gave it the time. I would say that it's not quite what Grady is saying. So let's get into Grady's process right after a quick word from our sponsor. And we're back. Let's jump into that cloud busting process from Grady. Grady says, um, well, I did ask him if he needed orgone, and he said, I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> That's yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Nice. All in one for Grady. Extra points. <laughs> That's a quote. Um, so then I just asked about the process, and Grady said, um, you just focus your intent on a puffy cloud that wouldn't dissipate quickly. So he's already taking into account that the cloud is going to dissipate at some point, but he's saying target one that at least to your understanding or the way you're judging that cloud, it's not going to quickly dissipate, uh, observably. He says, be sure to be busting a cloud that won't fake you out because he's he, again saying it may fake you out in that it will just dissipate. And you think, Oh, I did that. Ah, okay. Um, great, great. Yeah. Yeah. He says he tried for the longest time just using his intention at first And that just, in his mind, that was just, you know, staring at a cloud 
and in his mind thinking that cloud will no longer be there, right? This cloud will dissipate. He got really frustrated because it wasn't working. He got really, really frustrated, but he didn't stop. He didn't give up. He was able to find a process, he says, that kind of sounds goofy when you hear it, but it's it's worked for him numerous times. Ben, do you want to describe what he says? Yeah. So Grady says, you take a deep belly breath. Deep, take your time, and you blow at the cloud while saying the word goodbye in your head, having that as your mantra, goodbye. And then soften your gaze around the cloud, similar to like looking like uh, at the old magic eye posters, I almost hmm. think. Mm -hmm. uh, and soften your gaze around the cloud. And he says, this is almost like I was able to trick my psychic muscle into making the clouds start to dissipate. Uh, and then he has some more detail about this, uh, something else that happened the first time he tried it. Oh, yeah. He said, it's, it's really weird, Ben, because it feels like it matches up with, uh, what's his name, dude, who does the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind? Um, guy we talked to on the show a while ago. Oh, uh, Stephen Greer? Stephen Greer, who uses meditation and intention to summon UFO encounters. It kind of reminds me of that. Because Grady said he saw an orb flying over him that first day when he was able to successfully bust a cloud. Which sounds so dirty, but it's not. It's just you're making a cloud dissipate. I don't know why busting a cloud sounds dirty to me. I think it's busting. <laughs> Just busting in general. You could say busting anything. You know, I'm about to bust the Florida over here. It still sounds weird. <sighs> Sorry. I, I feel like I've been 12 years old on these episodes lately. All right. <clears throat> here we go. Um, but he, uh, Grady does say that the process may be different for everyone. That's just what's worked for him. He did uh, get his friend, his one of his best friends, to try it with uh, that person's girlfriend, and they did seem to be able to use that same process and make it happen. Uh, Grady's advice to all of us is if this particular process isn't working for you, that, he's, uh, that Grady has outlined here, just to try experimenting with it. Right, which which lines up with the idea of intention. You know, this reminds me of when we when we spoke with our good pal Cody. Uh, they are a practitioner of chaos magic, and they said had some beautiful things to say about the idea of magic, which on this show we consider weaponized psychology. They said it's really the intention one lends to a thing, the importance one attributes to it in one's mind. Uh, and, you know, I think, Matt and Grady and all the rest of us, I think one of the best ways to approach stuff like this is to think through how we could best create parameters for a reproducible experiment. And I love that you're doing this, Grady, by, by going to someone else and saying, hey, you try it, right? Let me case test. Let me see what else happens here. So for instance, I, I, I need your help with this, Matt. For instance, if we are, if we're building an observable, reproducible experiment to see whether the human mind can dissipate clouds in the atmosphere, then we would need as many things as possible to be the same except for the people, right? So ideally we'd want, well, we'd want the same couple of different locations, right? Mm -hmm. um, in case there was something wonky and unique to one location. We want a couple different locations where we know there are there's a reliable population of clouds. We would want to know observably the time that they form and dissipate, like what that time span is. We'd want some real-time monitoring of atmospheric conditions, right? I am we're fun at parties, folks, we promise. And then we would want um, we'd want different people right? And it's very difficult to control for psychology. But I think maybe the big thing is we want to set up an experiment that gives us the timeline, the lifespan of a cumulonimbus cloud or a cumulus cloud. And then we would want to see if observation interferes with that timeline. Or we could do another thing where you take a place that always has gray clouds and see if someone can think a hole through it 
right? A very specific hole, like, hey, we're going to bring the moon out kind of thing and see if multiple people can do that or one person could do it multiple times. Or, or is observation of the clouds quote unquote natural lifespan, is that like when you try to see if light is a particle or a wave? Is the mere mm. fact of applying human consciousness to it already exchanging, like, you know, messing up the experiment? Okay. What happens if you focus on the wrong cloud and instead Ooh. it's a jean jacket? Huh? Remember that? <laughs> Remember that movie? <laughs> nope. Anyone? Uh, what that, a great film. Don't, don't, don't focus your intention on one of those things. We have learned. Thanks, we have. Peel. What, what it, I mean... You know, and and should we be busting clouds? What have they done? You know what I mean? Yeah, man. It's just but bust, wait, I think we've got it. Huh? <laughs> I think we've got the lines that we could do right. Like these are things we could do, or someone could do uh, to to really explore this experiment. And I just, I know Matt, I know both of us. Both of us don't really enjoy it when folks dismiss something out of hand. So that's mm -hmm. why we're we're careful to say, okay, how could we get our heads around this question, right? How could we see this experiment in action? What what are the current um, accepted scientific explanations? What else is out there? That's the exciting stuff, and I want I want to hear more people. Uh, more people's cloud busting stories, or if there is anybody who is a practicing dowser or a rainmaker or something like that, that would be amazing to hear. Um, we did a dowsing episode, didn't we? Years back, I think we brought up dowsing uh, on the video, maybe, maybe, maybe we do it in a yeah. Okay, no, no, we've given ourselves some homework. Uh, and, and thank you, Gray. I think, I think now we uh, maybe we wrap up the episode by delivering on our promise. Uh, we wanted to play some more voicemails, uh, and we may not be able to dive super deep into all of them. But uh, folks, credit where it's due. Credit is very important to me. Uh, our own Matt Frederick, the one and only Mr. Matt Frederick, has been a beast on these voicemails. And, and Matt, you found. Uh, you found some very interesting stories. Oh, yes. This message comes to us from, I think she calls herself Oz Woman. I think that's what I'm hearing. Uh, it's sometimes a little difficult to to understand like the code name of someone when I'm going through these. I believe that's what her, her name is. And she's responding to a listener mail uh, message that we got from Tone, who was discussing this weird modem noise. Uh, or the tone, so we call them tone, and she just has some um, interesting insight, let's say, on a similar situation. Hi, guys. This is Oz Woman in Idaho. I have a message for tone. Okay. Um, I, too, heard something weird on my wireless late one night. I was not on my PlayStation. I was actually on my computer when suddenly my computer got hacked. That's almost impossible because I'm a Microsoft engineer with a high level of security clearance. So I keep all of my products at top, top, top VPN, top everything. Suddenly my computer is going off and I... It's not only my computer, it's my phone, it's a couple other things. Well, I called CenturyLink immediately, and they traced it. They traced the IP address, and we found it was a guy living in my neighborhood, I will say, my town, who uh, had brought home a little black box from a three-letter uh, affiliation. Um, and he was playing with it, um, seeing if he could hack into things, do things like this. And this was right near when those oil platforms got hacked and some other things got hacked. Well, apparently this little black box, that's just what I'm going to call it, was used in a lot of hacking situations overseas. And this guy thought it would be real cute to bring it home from work. Um... My advice to Tone is get a VPN, get a really good one, get Nord, get something, get somebody on the phone. If you begin, call your company. Call immediately customer service. Get some help. 
because I didn't like it. I let this guy's supervisor know that I had a secret or better clearance and that I was pissed. I was picked. And so my advice is somebody is messing around. Somebody's trying to see what you're doing. Somebody's, yeah, they're, they're, they're trying. They're trying to get in. So uh, my advice is uh, don't mess with this. Get a VPN. And if you ever hear it again, call your provider and tell them that you have been hacked in a major serious way and that they need to get some people out to help you. So this is this is massive. This is someone with experience uh, who is who is speaking about this stuff. Uh, full disclosure, uh, several VPN services have sponsored this show in the past, including NordVPN. Um, I do think Nord uh, is... I do think Nord is pretty solid, um, but also, uh, I, but also, I think this is great advice in general. You know, especially if you were lis- if you were listening to our show in a part of the world where um, the current regimes may be more oppressive, maybe more eye of Sar- Sauron on you, then you already have a VPN. If you're lucky enough to live in a democratic society or one that purports to be one, then you should probably still have a VPN. And Matt, I know that's something you and I are in lockstep about. Oh yeah, Ben, totally. Uh, VPN all the way, all day, every country. Just be in every country at all times. Yeah. Yeah, this is the, <laughs> I wish I could have a VPN for where I'm physically at, walking around like analog, you know? Who's that at the Publix? Some guy from Switzerland. Uh, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a terrible joke. But uh, but yeah, we want to air this response. I think we have time for, what do you think, maybe one or two more? Sure. And for our last voicemail, let's jump to a message we received from Sergeant Williams, who uh, I spoke to as well. Sergeant Williams is an awesome human being. Let us hear this message. Hey, Sergeant Williams here again. Um, I'm not trying to bug you guys. Um, I'm kind of trying to utilize you guys as my like private research group. But like, um, here's the, here's the thing. So at the end of World War II. With Project Paperclip and all that stuff, don't worry, I'm not like a conspiracy. I'm not like trying to do a conspiracy, but think about this for a second. So at that time, the United States was against the Nazis, right? And then all of a sudden, we got a bunch of Nazis. We brought them in to the space program. We brought them into high-level positions like um, our intelligence agencies. We based it on the Nazi intelligence agencies. Actually, we listened to their top agent, right? to learn about that. So, and then that's when all those experiments started, the LSD, the, the, you know, Tuskegee experiments, all that crap that occurred that happened after they came over and we put them in charge. And I'm thinking, dude, the Nazis didn't really lose. They just can't kind of came over and transitioned into the United States. So if you guys could look into that and figure it out, That'd be cool. That's all. I know it's weird, but anyway, love the show. Love the book. Bought two copies. I mean, I bought the book and then I bought the audio book. But um, anyway, love you guys, man. All right. Take it easy. Oh, man. Oh, this is not okay. I don't know. I don't know if Mission Control is going to let that fly while we were playing that message, Matt. But there's a part where he's like, where, <laughs> where Sergeant, you were saying, you know, I'm not a conspiracy guy or anything. You know, I was like, I am. Uh, <laughs> because, because you're absolutely right. One thing a lot of people in this country, in the United States rather, uh, are not aware of is that uh, the powers that be in the U.S. Uh, in the lead up to World War II. Many of them were huge fans of Nazi ideals. Nazis learned a lot about eugenics from stuff grown on American shores, from horrific uh, experiments and policies in the United States. And the idea that the U.S. modeled uh, some modern iterations of intelligence, uh, both in methods and in organization, from uh, scientists that they had scooped away or from officials they had scooped away, 
makes sense to me, honestly, because God knows the rocket technology was modeled in a similar iteration, right? Applying a similar process. Now, the thing is, um, for some of the stuff from the Axis powers, like the horrors of Unit 731 in Japan or something, the science they were doing had some value, but it was actually really bad science. It didn't hold up to a lot of rigors, right? But the idea of organizational innovation, right? The idea of creating cells of networks and stuff. Um, you see tactics that work applied across countries, across cultures, across time, like assassination, you know, or like French fries. There's not one restaurant that owns French fries. They just know French fries work for their intended purpose. And I know that's a really messed up comparison, man. I'm sorry, but I mean, I'm just, this one, this one speaks to me because you know that uh, I and some uh, like-minded, dare I say, co-conspirators are working on a story coming out January, February, I can't remember, about, um, about this period of time, the interwar years in the United States. It's a story that doesn't often get told to the detriment of the West, and I would argue the world. But, but what, uh, like, does it have I'm a sorry. name? It does. Can we say it? It will be, it will be a name we can say uh, right, <laughs> a little okay. bit later. But, okay, okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, hopefully people will enjoy it. We worked hard on it. Um, but this, this brings me to... Um, God, I'm talking so much, man. I, like when you hear Sergeant Williams say, uh, essentially, why aren't more people talking about what what the U.S., what Uncle Sam in particular garnered from that regime in Germany? What's your initial reaction? Uh, my fascination goes directly to the intelligence aspect of it, um, simply because I was fully aware after our research into the aerospace field here in the United States and the forming of basically all, a lot of our technology, all of our technology, you know, go into thinking about Huntsville, Alabama and uh, word of Ron Brown and all of that. Uh, I knew that I understood that. I think a lot of people widely understand that the intelligence angle and side I'm not aware of, and I can't even confirm right now, from you know any research of my own so i want to look into that further for sure yeah i'm gonna i'm i think we can both rank it as if not proven we can rank it as plausible sadly again because methods that work will be applied in other in other fields right where wherever they can grant an edge or an insight and we know that in the world of intelligence like don't let the movies fool you folks. The idea of sleeper agents, especially in an age of surveillance, they're an endangered species. It's pretty tough to pull off. It's pretty easy for them to get burned. Um, and there's not a way to walk them back now, not realistically. Uh, but the idea of taking tried and true methods and applying them in, in intelligence is um, more about listening right so if you can get access to people who are on the inside and say hey this is how we did stuff right this is how our kitchen worked then you would be um you would only be competent in applying those methods to your own kitchen your own restaurant yeah. so Oh, it's so an air it, fryer, it's, not a convection <laughs> oven. Wait, mm -hmm. isn't that the same thing? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is your mise en place. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, a little sous vide. Let's try that. Um, and it doesn't even have to be necessarily a kitchen analogy. Think of it in the world of uh, manufacturing, right? That's why, people, that's why people hire folks from different companies, you know, Oh, this is how you handle uh, this. Is how you handle axles and struts, right? Or this is your EcoBoost technology. Whatever proprietary name you put on it, let me learn more, right? Take me into your factory, and I'll use those lessons in my own. So this, unfortunately, does make sense. And for anyone who notes how unethical that is, right? how you you are quite possibly giving a pass 
to war criminals, which did happen. The U.S. absolutely did that. So did South American countries. Uh, if you, when we think of that, we have to also think of the opposite. What if they didn't take that opportunity to collect that intelligence, to take those lessons learned and improve their methods? It's very dark, very dangerous stuff, but it's a great question. So Matt, I say that uh, it's time for us to call it a day and uh, dig in. I think we've got some homework, man. We've got, uh, you know, this this week, just in Strange News and Listener Mail, we ran into some things that are amazing uh, rabbit holes. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're going to cloud bust all the pistols in public bathrooms while investigating the our neighbor's little black boxes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, not, uh, and uh, we're going to do that all with the help of a uh, some friends at a at a little building in Atlanta that we cannot call a Chinese police station, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we're doing it all to stop a uh, another coup in Germany, etc. Uh, <laughs> so that's our show. Thank you, as always, so much for tuning in. This has been our Whoops All Voicemails listener segment. Uh, listener mail segment. We're going to have more on the way. Keep them coming. We cannot wait to hear from you. Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all the hits, all the hits. And if you don't sip the social meds, if you want to uh, talk to us directly. Uh, maybe get a call from Matt. Maybe, maybe even me. And maybe I'll maybe I'll cross that Rubicon. Uh, then why not give us a phone call? Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. When you call in, give yourself a nickname and uh, say whatever you want. At the end of the three minutes that you're allotted per voicemail, please let us know if we can use your name and voice on one of our listener mail episodes. Those are really the only rules. If you got more to say that can fit in that three minutes, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Bonus points for puns. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.